Good morning, everyone, and thank, thank you for getting up so early to, to listen to me. I hope you won't be disappointed. Um, I'm going to start with a nice, bright, sunny morning. It looks brighter on here than it is. Oh, that's better. That's better. So I thought I'd start nice and bright. I put some pictures on here of the project that I, that I led, that, uh, that Thomas's team were very, very closely involved with. And you'll see some of the some of the tea. I, I couldn't get everyone on there, but there's there's a couple of pictures there with, and that one was taken two years ago here. Um, and you'll see there's actually if you identify any people on there, there is um, there are none of the Mendel um, staff on there because they were too busy organising the conference. So that's uh, now what do I do? Ah, that's it. That worked. So th this is the talk. As usual, I've probably got far too much to say, so I'll try and fit it all in the time I've got, but, uh, but my, my able chair here will tell me when I run out of time, and then I'll go very, very fast at the end. So if you look very carefully, I've done something very clever here. Um, so the project that I led was called IPPEAE, which is spelled I-P-P-H-E-A-E. -E. So if you look at the words in my presentation, um, so it's a bit contrived, you know, but it actually spells IPPEAE down there. And so I'm going to talk about a journey. And the journey's far from over. You know, we're, we're still on that journey. And a bit of it is in, the, in, is in the past, a bit of it is in the present, and a bit of it is in the future. So where are we going, what we did, what, 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 our, what our goals were, whether we achieved them, um, you know, where do, was it value for money, um, and, and also where we're going next and what we're going to do. So that's where I'm going. So you'll know when we're get, getting near the end, because we... We'll get to the expectations at the end. So, the project that, that we um, were involved in was a European-funded project, and I'll t give you the details in a few minutes. And the idea was um, that we would explore policies across, the, across Europe, was, was the original intention. We narrowed it down slightly when we started to run out of time, so we actually looked at 27 e European Union countries. And we started off with an aim to work out what different universities, what different uh, countries were doing to try and stem the tide of plagiarism, what policies were in place, whether they were working, what the awareness was, and so on. So the, the, the project was about evidence gathering um, and looking at... Um, looking at higher education, particularly looking at bachelor and master's level, and um, looking inside institutions, but also looking at what different countries were doing, wh whether there was any kind of national level initiatives, and so on. But we also set out to develop some tools and resources and try and make um, a difference within the, the project itself, um, and, and gather some case studies where we found good practice and things that were worth, worth sharing. And the whole thing was about trying to make sure that the standards and the, and the, and the quality of, of the, um, of the um, higher education programs were being maintained. So I, I like that picture because it, it, it reminds me of a real tangle of a mess of a stuff that we found. And because I think it is like that, it's very, very complicated. That was taken in uh, Bucharest, by the way, that one. We were just going past on the tram and we thought it was a lovely way to manage your wiring and stuff. And so, this is a project. It was called Impact of Policies for Plagiarism, lots of Ps, in Higher Education Across Europe, or IFI, IFI for short. And it was funded by the Erasmus Lifelong Learning Programme. It was a modernization of higher education project. So, we were looking at higher education policy. And it started in October 2010, and it finished, formally finished in September 2013. Um, Coventry University was the lead partner, but we also had partners in Poland, and that was the Technical University of Łódź, um, Mendel University in Brno, very good partner. Um, we had the, what it started off as being the Ag Agricultural University in Kaunas in, in Lithuania, that changed its name, and I'm not going to try and pronounce that, but the name's on there. Um, and also the University of Nicosia. So we had to have somewhere nice and warm to go um, at the end. So that, that was the, that was the, um, the kind of partners. So it was just five, five partners. And I, as the lead partner, I can tell you five was quite enough. I would, wouldn't want it any more. Um, and we had um, just under €400,000 to spend, and the project lasted for three years. But actually, 
it took over my life and I'm, it, I've only just finished. The last report has only just been finished. So it, it isn't a three-year project because we were working on it for a year before just to get the bid in. And it's still part of my life now. So it's, it's a kind of lifelong commitment once you've done something like that, particularly if you get involved in it and it, it, really, it really has an impact. Um, so what did we achieve? Well, we, we surveyed the 27 countries. It was variable how much data we got in different countries. As Thomas was saying yesterday when he showed you the graph, those of you who were in Thomas's talk yesterday, um, we didn't get enough data from some countries. We, it was very, very thin because it was difficult to persuade some countries and some institutions to take part in the survey. Because it was, you know, we had no way of compelling people to do that. But we managed to... Uh, communicate and, and get information from over 200 institutions across Europe. We had three, three questionnaires and we actually had those questionnaires translated into 14 different languages. So that was a, quite a feat in itself. The questionnaires were for students, teachers, senior management within higher education. Um, we also ran as a separate kind of sub-project. We ran um, some student focus groups, which is becoming a PhD that's not quite finished yet. Um, but we also did uh, some interviews with uh, national level figures and senior management figures. And I personally did about 70 inter uh, semi-structured interviews and lots of really rich data from that. So altogether, we gathered about 5,000 anonymous responses. And I would have liked to have had 10 times that. You know, that really wasn't enough data. And I'd there were lots of patchy missing bits in that. So, you know, we're far from complete. But what we got is a snapshot. So we haven't got, you know, reproducible, um, you know, a sample of uh, representative data. What we've got is a snapshot. And it's the first time anyone's done that. So, you know, it, it, it was quite an achievement. In order to make sense of the data at the end, we created something called the Academic Integrity Maturity Model. So I, I, I developed that right at the very end. And I'll say a little bit more about that later, or quite a lot more about that later on. Um, and that allowed us to compare the, the, the policies across the, um, across the European Union. We also developed um, something like 12 different case studies of different quality, different different um, uh, outcomes, which we haven't published. And those are, if anybody wants those, if you go onto the website for the project, you can see what those are, and, and I will send copies of those to people. What I almost forgot to say, and is really important, is that um, Thomas's team also developed um, a, a, a software uh, anti-plagiarism tool, should we call it, um, called Anton, um, which is, I think, still being developed it still needs quite a lot more work on that, but it actually is part of the, um, the, the tool set that IS4U have got now, um, and you know, that, that's, that was quite an achievement as well. And, and we developed lots of uh, workshops and things, and we ran those uh, um, at different times during the project to try and make a difference within the lifetime of the project. So f very quick findings. I'm, I, ha I haven't put a lot of the results in the talk because I wanted to talk a little bit more about the future um, side of this. We found quite a lot of good practice. So we've, we, you know, we can't ignore the good practice. It's, it's really, really good. We found a lot of not so good practice, um, which, which we tend to focus in on. Um, Sweden and Austria are quite different from other countries in that they collect statistics. Um, and they, they collect statistics annually from higher education institutions. And therefore, they have some way of kind of monitoring. But unfortunately, the statistics that they that they capture and collect and, and use for monitoring purposes are not consistent because there are not consistent policies within the institutions. So I'm, I'm all for trying to catch statistics because I think that actually helps us to see where we're getting and have some kind of idea of whether or not what we're doing is, has, any, has any impact. But it only has any uh, value if what you're comparing is apples and apples and not apples and oranges. Um, and Unfortunately, that tends to be the case. So until you actually get people collecting the same kind of data in the same way, under the same conditions, that data has, a, has limited value. But I have to say, the, certainly some countries came out better in terms of the students' perception of what plagiarism was and the students' understanding. And that's also a very good indication that there are good things going on within those countries. Um, 
Slovakia is, is, was notable as well because um, they have, they, their students came out quite highly rated in terms of their knowledge and understanding. And, and they have a national uh, system of screening um, um, the final theses. But again, the criticism I would put there is that you need to start much earlier than when the students hand in their final piece of work. But, you know, but congratulations to them for doing that. Um, and the UK and, and Ireland and the Republic of Ireland have a, a different profile um, to most of the rest of Europe because of their culture of uh, quality assurance mainly and also their commitment to continuing professional development and research and so on. And I think we started quite a lot earlier than the rest of Europe in terms of looking at, at those things. So we're a little bit more advanced. So there are things to be learned from there. Um, so those are the good things, so very, very in, in a nutshell. But very, um, a lot of the other things were quite negative. So here, here are a list of things that, that we need to kind of look at. Clearly there is, a, there is an inconsistency in the way people view what is good practice, what is acceptable practice. So that's one of the fundamental things we need to get right, is get people to sing on the same hymn sheet. Uh, because if, if we're all... We have, if we have differences in what we perceive as being good practice and not good practice, then we're never going to agree on what, what a good policy is. There's a focus in some countries on... I think people are beginning to develop policies, and the policies that are coming out are, tend to be for research level or PhD, and people are ignoring the lower level. You know, certainly the initiatives that, that I've seen uh, yes, yes, we, we deal with, we have policies for our PhD students or our researchers, but they're not actually beginning at a lower level. And I personally believe that we really ought to be starting at secondary level and, and, and getting the, um, the skills in place and making sure um, younger people understand and that they bring those skills through them right the way through their education. So, you know, there's a lot more work to be done there. Um, most of the t students and teachers that we, that we talk to, and the managers as well, agree that there has to be much more training and that training needs to continue. Some said, well, no, we've already got enough, far too much, but, you know, fair enough. In, in some places, that might be the case. And in, in Germany in particular, we came across this wonderful situation where we asked two professors if they thought they should have some training and to help them to get up to speed and keep up to speed. And shock, horror, no, who, who could possibly train me? I'm a professor. You know, who would be qualified to train me? So that was a very interesting uh, remark and very, very interesting finding. But that was unusual. But, uh, that, was, but that is indicative of, of some of the kind of higher-ranking institutions, particularly in the UK, where people think they're beyond any kind of, uh, um, kind of information. Um, there's a lot of misunderstanding. There's a lot, there's a lot of um, ac um, acceptance that if people get some kind of digital tool, and once they've got that digital tool, everything will be fine, you know? And this, is, this kind of over-reliance on the idea that let's, let's, have, let's have turn it in, or I've got to say it like gherkin, haven't I? Erkin? Gherkin? Or however it's said, sorry about that. Or what's the other one? <laughs> <laughs> Strike plagiarism, whatever it is, whatever your tool is. Um, and of course, we need to, to get the message out there that these are tools, they're useful. Yes, they have their uses, but they're not everything. They're, they're just part of the tool set that we need to develop. Um, there's a lot of head in the sand. Um, and here's a, here's a quote uh, in, in Estonia in particular. Uh, have you got any policies for plagiarism? We don't need any policies for plagiarism because we don't have any plagiarism. So, you know, that's, we... I don't need to tell people in this, in this room what that actually implies. Um, and there's a sense of resignation in some countries, which is very, very sad, particularly Bulgaria, Romania, where people said, yes, we, we know it's, all, it, it's going on, it's all, all, all over the place. And also in, in, in Poland, we found this as well. It, it's, you know, plagiarism, that's what we call homework. I think that was one of the quotes. Um, <clears throat> and, and here's a, a quote from uh, Romania. There are no effective enforcement measures here. And that isn't true of all institutions, because I know there are some Romanian institutions doing that, but that was one of the quotes that came out. So, and, you know, we can't do anything about it, because the, the problem is too big, and there are more, there are more important things to face than, than, than that, um, you know. So, from all of that came the, this concept of what makes good policies. So how do we define what a good policy is? 
Because, you know, who am I to say that my policies are better than your policies? So we came across this, this concept, and, and this came to me from, from my computer science background, because I use something called the, um, the CMMI, which is the Capability Maturity Model. And it, was, it was developed by Carnegie Mellon University. And they have, uh, they have a, um, the, that's Capability Maturity Model infrastructure. So I, I, I thought about, we might have something like that for, for policies, for integrity. So we developed um, a concept of that. So here's, here's just one snapshot. I haven't given you any more um, uh, kind of specific answers, but here is one question that we asked, and this is a t some teachers' responses. Again, like Thomas, I haven't put all the different countries in because where, where it was a, a low return, it wouldn't be very meaningful results. So I've sorted them on, the questions are about, does your institution uh, take, um, has a, have a serious approach to, first of all, plagiarism detection, and then secondly, plagiarism prevention. And it's sorted uh, the greens in terms of strongly agree and agree with that, with that question. I believe this institution takes a serious approach. So you'll see the blues are actually the disagreeing and the greens are the agrees. So um, the teachers believed in, in Slovakia, in UK, in um, Malta, in, in Austria, Czech Republic. Most of, you can see the majority of people believed, agreed with that, that there was a serious approach to plagiarism detection. Quite a, a peak on the negatives on Finland and France, um, also Portugal um, and Cyprus. Those are the kind of higher peaks on the blues there. On the plagiarism prevention, slightly different pattern. And we've got Malta being the most positive. Uh, again, Slovakia, UK. Um, um, Belgium, interesting. Is that Belgium? No, sorry, that wasn't Belgium. That was, that was I can't read that. Um, that was Estonia, okay? But, yeah, I've, I've told you about Estonia. They don't have any plagiarism there. Um, and, the, and the negatives... The, the, the blue negatives on the on the prevention was France, uh, Germany, Finland, um, Portugal, Bulgaria, and so on. So that kind of gives you an idea. There's a, there's a mixed response there, isn't there? Some some are saying yes, we we're strong, and some are saying no. And that might be institutional differences, or it might be just perceptions of individuals um, in terms of what they think is a go is a good. Um, uh, response to detection and prevention and so on. So this is a diagram that, that Thomas showed in his presentation yesterday. Um, and this is the comparison of the 27 countries. They're all on there. And that was derived from taking the data from the four levels, from students, teachers, managers, and national interviews, and translating it into metrics. And some of that, you know, as you can imagine, Thomas helped me enormously to get some of the metrics into a, a scale that, could, um, that we could quantify. But because this model was retrofitted to the data, we didn't actually think about doing something like this until very near the end of the project. I think it was in September, wasn't it, when we were working on it, when Thomas was across in the, uh, in the UK, um, and, and we managed to, to get it to work. Um, after the project, I, I looked at it again to, to, to see if I could improve on this. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what I did on that. So for those of you who weren't in Thomas's talk yesterday, or if you didn't kind of re remember what he said, this was based on nine different metrics. So we took questions from the surveys and tried to quantify in terms of a scale of, of naught to four on each of those nine metrics. So the highest score that any country could get was 36 on that score. And uh, of that, the UK came top overall. But there were some of the countries came top in, in, in certain categories. So what that did was, was to, to, to give a kind of measure of, comparatively, of how, how countries stand on those, on those uh, uh, nine different metrics. And, and then for each country, if you look at the comparative report, there's a page for each country, and there is a, a rather nice... Um, graph here. Now that was um, when I was here two years ago we were trying to work out how to depict what kind of graphics to use and a wonderful gentleman from Canada, and I've forgotten his name and I met him when I was in Vancouver um, in um, March he came and talked to me and he came up with the radar chart 
with the spider diagram, and, and I think that works really well uh, because you can see by the by the polygon there that it, that it forms where the strengths and the weaknesses are on, e on each of the metrics. So I think we're going to continue to use that on the on the developed tool. So that's the UK one, and you see the the larger the the polygon is, the strength the stronger the policies are, and but you can see where the strengths and weaknesses are, and some countries, some institutions, if you like will have strengths in one area and weaknesses in another. And when I was developing that, it occurred to me right at the beginning that actually this would be a really good tool, not just for countries, it would be a great tool to use on institutions. You know, because wouldn't it be nice to be able to do that for an institution and say, right, your policies are good um, in this area, but they're not so good in this area. So that was my intention. As soon as I got all this project stuff out of the way, I would start working on this and, um, and develop that into a tool that we could use for uh, institutions. So what did we achieve? Where, where did we get? You know, how, how high did we go? Because I needed something with an H. Um, and that's Mount Etna, by the way, and that was taken uh, a few weeks back. I was in Sicily. It was very nice. And, it, and it, you see it was smoking as well. It's it quite, quite nice. I took that from the car as we were driving along. I wasn't driving. <laughs> so we know the we know the results from um, if he have been um, taken seriously by lots of different people because I'm contacted all the time and there are lots of people downloading the results. So I'm really pleased about that. Incidentally, I haven't said, if you want to have a look at any of the results, all the reports are online. Um, the, the website address is at the end, but I can give you that. It's quite an easy one to remember. It's just iffy.eu. That's the website, http iffy.eu. Um, and then the results are all there on the page. Uh, there are some executive summaries, because some of the reports are really quite long and tedious. Anyone who's read them will realize. Um, but the, um, and the EU-wide report brings it all together, and, and that gives you just a snapshot for each country. Um, for example, I was invited last year, I, did th I went three times to Republic of Ireland. They kept inviting me back to, dif to meet different groups of people to talk about integrity. And in June last year, they... Um, introduced a, a national policy on um, on academic integrity which is fantastic so you know and they linked that to the project and they you know um, they were really kind of pleased to um, to review the report and to see what was good and bad about about Ireland so you know I know that that is one really good positive thing the survey is already being reused um, because the survey questions in different languages obviously are still available, and we spent a lot of time developing those questions. The survey was a bit long, and I think that was one of the reasons we didn't get very many answers, you know, as many as we like. But the questions were really good, and there's some fantastic data there. So the survey questions are being used, but also I'm still reanalyzing that data, and there's still lots of data there that, that can be played with. Um, and if anybody wants to have a play with that, let me know, and we can see if we can release that. Um, recently, I've been involved in a little bit broader um, research. I'm, I've certainly worked with um, um, various other, you know, networking with different people. Um, we started off looking at plagiarism, but actually very quickly we realized we'd have to broaden that out. You can't just look at plagiarism. You've got to look at academic integrity. And also, instead of spinning it negative, we, re we realized early on that we really need to be more positive about that. One of the things I, I forgot to mention on that big slide with all the partners on, right at the outset we had Jude Carroll was, was our advisor and she was a fantastic person to, to help kickstart the project because she gave us the direction and she told us, don't look at attitudes and things like that, but that's all been done. You need to look at policies and, and, and that really steered us in the right direction. Um, so certainly looking at things in a more positive light um, helps enormously. Um, but more recently, I've been involved with talking to people who are looking at corruption in education and people like Transparency International and we're putting in a little bit for some, some funding um, in looking in de uh, developing countries. I'll say a little bit more at the end if I get time, <laughs> but don't run out of time. Um, but one of the great values of being part of a project like this is that we end up with being part of this kind of community. And, you know, we're all here for the same reason, aren't we? And there's some absolutely amazing people coming at the, coming at the research from lots of different angles. And that's one of the great powers of being part of a project that, that actually comes out with some useful results, 
is that suddenly you're accepted by, by this, this community of people, of like-minded people, and you're helping to, to, do, to develop new policy, you're helping to develop new ideas, and so on. That's really, really, really good. So I was, in, I was in, invited to talk to the, um, what are they called? It's IIEP, the, uh, the Institute for Educational Planning, International Institute for Educational Planning, that's part of UNESCO in, in Paris in um, you know, a, a couple of months back. And that was where I met all these people that were involved with corruption, particularly looking at education, corruption in education. And that really opened my eyes to the, to the other kinds of things that are going on. But also at that meeting, um, there was a representative from the Council of Europe called Ian Smith, who announced that the IFI project was being taken forward and was going to be extended to transition or developing countries. Um, and I'm, trying to f I'm still trying to find out what that means. But the announcement yesterday um, is another kind of um, piece in the jigsaw because I'll be going to the, the, um, the launch in, um, in Prague in October, and I think Thomas is going to be there as well, um, because they want us to present as a, as a case study, if you like, to that forum, to that initiative, all about the IFI project. So that's absolutely brilliant that that's kind of going forward on, on that, and it's going to be seen as part of that. It's, if you remember yesterday, there were four points, and that's part of the second of, the second of those four points. So that's really good news that... Um, that the, the research is going to be, be used and it's going to help to, to inform policy and perhaps the, the questions will be, um, be used and, and, and run in different countries. So watch this space. Um, and we're not really sure how, whether we're going to be personally involved, but at least the, the work from the project is going to be taken very, very seriously. So was it good value for money? Well, I think it was. You know, it, it, for, uh, 400,000 euros is not a huge amount of money. And also it was 75% it was funded. So the partners' institutions picked up 25% of that funding. I think all the partners gained a lot from, from the project. But, but actually, I think Europe gained a lot from it as well. And, and the results were very well received. And they paid us all the money, which was quite nice. Um, we have some useful evidence as I said at the beginning, uh, and it's reusable, and, and it's, it's still not been fully analysed. There's just a lot of data there. Disappointingly, not much has changed so far. There are little pockets of things going on. Certainly there's things in Poland we heard. Um, but also I'm hearing that there's lots more research going on in, in little pockets. And, and I think this kind of forum helps to bring all these isolated researchers in the different countries together, which is really important, because it, it can be quite an isolating experience to be sitting in a country and being, being seen as a, a, you know, an, an outlaw. And, out, and so it's really quite, quite good to have this kind of support network. And I think there's a lot, lot more awareness raised about what needs to be done through this project and through other projects as well. We need to continue. We haven't finished. We're just halfway on, no, not even halfway on the journey. We've got a long way to go yet. So where are we going next? Okay, so, um, and some of these pictures actually were taken by my colleague, uh, Richard Gatwood, who, I can't remember which ones are his and which ones are, because I just, had, they're all in, in, my, um, in my album kind of thing. Um, and Richard was originally part of the project. He was one of the initiators of the project, and he's long gone and moved on to, to new things. Um, but certainly we need to try and define what we mean by uh, policy, uh, what we mean by um, good policies. So we need to define some benchmarks on what are good policies. Um, and we need to find a way to assess institutional compliance and maturity against those benchmarks. And that, that's kind of my aspiration, to try and, to try and reach that. And, and I've already started to make some progress on that. I'll tell you about now. So I said earlier on, when, when I looked at the academic integrity maturity model aim that we, that we developed for comparing countries, I then reanalyzed the data. And also, I've, I've run um, some additional surveys on, on requests from people um, from institutions. I actually got them to run some institutional surveys to test the model. And so here are the, the six examples that came out of that. And I've, they're, they're anonymous. I'm not even going to tell you which country they're from. Um, but you can see there are differences there. And, and so those, are all, those have all been analysed. And those have, um, some of those have gone to the institutions, and they're really happy with that 
because it tells them where their strengths and the weaknesses are, if they believe what the, what the measures are. But that's one of the things we need to, to work on. Um, and there's also, so that's the institution that scored quite low, uh, institution 139. Uh, and you can see the polygon's quite low on that, so it, it, it shows that there are weaknesses there. But one of the things, if I can go back on that, I think I can go, can I go back on that? Yeah. Um, the number of metrics reduced to seven there from nine because a couple of the metrics I, I was getting from the higher level data and I was only using the teacher data and the student data on this particular um, testing. So, that, so that's where I am with, with that. Um, but of course this was based on kind of retrofitted metrics that I, I made up at, at the end. So Thomas went to um, just over a year ago, Thomas went to the, the ICAI conference in Florida and he presented the results of the project. He had a great time, didn't you? Very nice. And he met a lady called Tricia Bertram Gallant at that conference who said, I've got something like that. It's called AIRS and it's part of the tool set of the International Centre for Academic Integrity. So actually someone else had got something very similar to mine. Um, so Tricia and I got in touch and we've been talking to each other since then. So what we did was we compared the two tools and we've been working on trying to come up with a kind of hybrid tool set. So we haven't got a name for it yet. It's called AIRS AIM or AIM AIRS, depending on who you want to put the preference on. Um, but this is as far as we've got. Um, actually, we've got quite a lot further than this, but this is a summary of where we are. We have, and incidentally, Tricia appeared on Tracy's list of heroes yesterday, one of the pictures on there. Um, so we've come up with 10. They're, they're different from AIM, uh, and they're different from AIRS as well. But we've come up with 10, and we tested that in, in Vancouver against a, a small audience, and we got some really nice feedback on that. So we've refined it a little bit. And then against each of these 10, um, if, if you like, uh, characteristics of what we consider to be good policy, we've got a series of questions. And some of the questions are for teachers, some of them for students, some of them are, are for managers, and some of them are for experts in academic integrity. So the idea is that we will do it as a survey style um, uh, tool. So we're now working on that. And if anybody wants to help us to pilot this, um, my, my next job is to get those questions into a questionnaire style and then, then we can start to use it piloting. So we've got a list of, of institutions who want to help us pilot it. So if you want to join that list of institutions, I'd love to hear from you. And this was, didn't come just out of our heads. It came from talking together through using all the available tools because there's lots of stuff out there. There's Tracy's stuff that she's been working on. There's stuff that's been developed in the UK, the kind of policy works. There's the um, International Centre for Academic Integrities. They've got a huge manual, and there's lots of really good stuff in there. It's very old, but it's still all very valid and relevant. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. But it's still, there's some really great questions in there. So we took all of those things together, uh, together with the stuff that we got from IFI, and, and this is what we came up with. And, and it does seem to work quite well. And there are things in there that I didn't think of when, uh, when I was devising the original AIM. And there were things there that Trisha hadn't thought of as well. Uh, th but the, uh, the other thing is we're trying to make it truly international. And so that's why we want people to help us from different countries and across, across the globe. Because you know, if it's going to be useful to people, then it has to fit into different national contexts and different, different cultures. So, so that's my exciting news. That we've, we've been working on this. And it's pretty near to the point where we can, where we can start the pilot. But I need a lot of work done on, on uploading it onto a... a an online platform and then eventually we'll need to get some proper IT people in to actually create the tool itself that can actually do the, the, uh, the me measurements. Um, so that's quite exciting. So it's very slow isn't it and I think this comes up again and again. Thanks I've got five minutes so this comes up again and again. Um, will we ever get there? And I think the answer is we've just got to be patient. We really have to be um, we are getting there bit by bit, and every, everybody's research and everybody's um, efforts are gradually helping. There's a lot of challenges. Um, let's, let me just quickly read through them. Reaching the right people. 
that, that can have some influence. And certainly institutionally, you've got to get the, the top management involved, but you've also got to get the cull community as well that, to realize um, that there needs to be change. There's a lot of autonomy out there, either of institutions and individuals, and they don't like being told what to, be, what, what to do. Therefore, you've got to get them to understand or get them to, to, uh, to sing with you. Um, there's a lot of overworked, underpaid academics, second, third jobs. Who's going to worry about a, bit, a case of student cheating when, you know, when you've got so many other priorities in your life you know, and all the other pressures that come on? Large class sizes. And uh, these, these are nothing new. I think all of these have come up at some time in the last, in the last day. Scale of change needed, particularly in some countries where, where there, there's a whole culture of corruption within the society. How can you start to change? But that doesn't mean we don't need to try. Complacency, lack of interest, um, costs, um, fear of identification. So one of the barriers to participating in the survey in the first place was people didn't believe it was going to be anonymous. You know, they thought we were going to expose them and, and so on. Um, I know there's at least one person in the audience who knows what I mean by this, the shoot the whistleblower mentality. But I think, I think we all appreciate that. There's a lot of very brave people out there who are um, trying to expose, trying to change things, and they're being shouted down within their own communities. Lack of agreement on how to proceed, and we need to try and bring people with us on that. But also, uh, we're not standing still, are we? Things are, things are constantly changing. And recently, my effort in my own institution has been on, on exams and how you, how you stop students cheating in exams with all this new technology and stuff going on. And, and of course, I know um, Phil's going to talk to you about, about ghostwriting in the next one. So, so I've got a nice kind of map of the world. So challenges to future pro progress. And I think, I don't know whether you agree with me, but it is a, a global problem and therefore... Uh, we need a global solution. There are lots of things that we can't do on our own. We're going to have to try and get um, much more of a, a joint, joined up thinking on this. And, and I think Teddy's going to say more about that later on as well, about what we can do and what we should be doing in terms of, a, of joining up our thoughts and our, and our plans and, um, and our strategies. Um, I know I'm running out of time, so just quickly on priorities. Um, we need a consensus on, on, um, on, on what we're going to do. We need to understand um, the different contexts, how people are coming at this from different, in different ways. And we need to promote various things. And just very quickly, cultural of integrity on staff, effective use and stopping the abuse of technology, understanding what the technology can do for us and, uh, um, and making sure it's used correctly. Compatibility of statistics, um, if we're going to use statistics, and pre-university understanding. There's a few more things in there, but I'm going to have to rush through those. And there's the fireworks. Okay, so thanks to Tracy, that's a lovely picture. So I thought we'd end up bright as well. So there's the fireworks from last night. Weren't they fantastic? Oh, great. So, um, AIM airs, or airs AIM. Um, if you want to help, let me know. Um, I'm, we're personally putting in a, a little bid for some funding with, um, led by Brunel at the moment for research in Nigeria, Jamaica, India, and Armenia, working with uh, um, DFID, British, British Aid. Um, Council of Europe initiative sounds interesting. We'll see where that leads. Um, Mendel University is putting in for some project funding and hopefully that will come, come good. Um, I'm also doing lots of workshops and talks and um, I'm actually working with, with Phil in a couple of weeks' time. We're in Birmingham doing a workshop. Um, and I'm supposed to be retiring, so I'm actually... I'm, I'm now working 0.5 officially, um, so I'm semi-retired, and I'm, I've never been so busy in my life. Thanks to Tracy for this. And there, there's some references at the end there. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>